so I knew it was there was a process where it wasn't going to happen overnight. Because in addiction or as an addict, you're so used to responding impulsively that with that mindset, I think a lot of people have a hard time transitioning when they get into recovery to knowing that it's going to take a long time to heal a lot of the crap that you were dealing with before. I'm Doug Bobst, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. You just landed on a planet called episode 369, Hitting Bottom and Rising, From Opiate Addiction to a Life of Purpose with Doug Bobst. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of this conversation, I'd like to invite you to join my weekly newsletter. You can do so at lukestory.com slash newsletter. Once you enter your name and email, each and every week, we'll send you the complete transcripts, show notes, and links from every single conversation you'll hear on this podcast. Our sponsors today are blueblocks.com slash lifestylist for all things blue blocking eyewear and red light. Then we've got Eaton Hemp, an incredible brand for CBD and hemp products. And finally, beekeepersnaturals.com slash Luke Story for some incredible products from the bee world. The show you're about to hear is one that's very close to my heart due to my personal experience in the past with multiple drug and alcohol addictions. And I got to say, anyone who escapes this miserable trap has my utmost respect, as I know how hard it is to break this vicious cycle. Some of the topics we cover in this conversation with Doug are as follows. How Doug became addicted to opiates and ended up going to jail over it. The hopeless mindset of addiction and the damage it causes to family systems. Why the 12-step model wasn't a fit for him. And we also explore the root of addiction, shame, and trauma. The nature of addiction as a disease, not a moral shortcoming. The role of fitness in his journey of recovery how he turned his life around and became a beacon of hope for others. And finally, we talk about how to turn adversity into your greatest advantage. This is a truly inspiring story of one man's battle with his demons and how anyone can find their way up and out of failure into a life of service and success. And with that, enjoy this intimately vulnerable chat with Mr. Doug Bobst. And if you feel called, share it with a friend who could use some hope. You know, we share something in common, and that is that we both had a real hell of a time with addiction and and both managed to claw our way out of that crab bucket somehow. So I rarely go back to someone's origin story, but I think yours is kind of cool and perhaps a good hook to get people really invested in the best part of the story, which is how you're contributing to the world now. So uh, you're a kid and high school, maybe junior high, I'm 14, you start smoking a little weed, getting a little little frisky with the uh, the light drugs. Run us through the truncated version of how addiction kind of led you down the path it did. Yeah. And, and I guess to preface all this, it's interesting that I host, today I host a podcast called The Adversity Advantage. I'm a trainer. I'm, you know, I've spoken on, you know, to, to different schools and I've written a few books and I have the the complete blessing to be able to share my message and share my content now to, to so many people. But it wasn't long ago that my life was in complete shambles. I mean, I was incarcerated on felony drug charges back in 2008. I was suicidal. I had a horrific opiate addiction. I thought my life was over. I was, I was a convicted felon and I was completely out of shape. But before I talk about like how that led me to where I am now, I, I want to go back a little bit, as you were saying um, a few minutes ago, I did start smoking pot when I was 14. And as I look back, I was just like very similar to your story. I was looking for the fastest way I could to escape because I had so many insecurities growing up, so much trauma as I look back, so many painful experiences that I was really looking for the first way to manage it in a way that at the time seemed healthy because I wanted to numb myself as fast as I could. But obviously long-term, it was incredibly unhealthy. And some of the stuff that I experienced very similar to you is my parents got divorced when I was five. I suffered a lot of abuse growing up. I, I loved sports. I had this immense passion for sports. I loved collecting sports cards. I loved watching sports. I loved playing sports. I loved you know reading about it. But I was horrible at all of it. So I was always the kid that was cut. And I was like, why am I just less gifted than these other kids? Why me? And I started to develop this what's wrong with me mentality. Because that and the fact that um, my parents were divorced when when I was five and amongst my friends, I was the only kid whose parents were divorced. So I was like, what's wrong with me? Because back then the divorce rates are much lower than they are today. And, and as I look back, I think, you know, one of the things that 
was the first thing to help me self-medicate from a lot of the trauma and the bullying and everything that I experienced was food. Where for breakfast I'd eat cinnamon buns and bacon and sausage and pop tarts and yum yeah I mean <laughs> right <laughs> and and like eating tons of pasta for dinner and 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 I, as I look back though and I remember it wasn't like I was doing anything out of the ordinary I think my friends were eating very similarly but the problem was I just had bad genetics so combine that with me eating a little bit more than everybody else. I started wearing husky pants when I was a young kid. I started gaining some weight. And again, this what's wrong with me mentality just started to stack up. And you know, when I was 14, I was offered my first hit off of a marijuana pipe. Now, I want to I want to say this that when I started smoking pot, I mean much like when you started smoking, I never thought in a freaking million years that I would end up in jail. Nobody does. Nobody thinks that they're going to just going to take a hit off a marijuana pipe and then boom, they're going to go to jail. Because if they if people knew that and it was guaranteed, I guarantee you well, there's a lot of people that wouldn't do that. Because the consequences would far outweigh the risk, right? And and this is how it goes. I mean, it's a traditional trajectory of addiction. One hit, I feel this massive monkey come off my back that I could finally be at peace with who I was. I didn't have to worry if I was ever gonna find love because I never had a girlfriend in grade school. I didn't have to worry if I was ever gonna be successful because I was always kind of you know obviously anxious about my grades. I didn't have to worry about what my family dynamic was gonna be like or what I was going to do about sports, none of that. It was all gone. So, And it wasn't like I loved the taste of pot. I just loved the way it made me feel. So one hit led to two or led to three and so on and so forth. And now I'm building a tolerance, building a, a little bit of a habit. And I'm having to smoke every single day now because I'm getting used to that addicting feeling. And the problem also is that when you're 14 years old, pot's expensive to a 14 year old. I mean, paying like $20 for a gram or 50 bucks for an eighth or whatever it was back then. Like when you're making, I don't remember what I was making, like five bucks an hour, six bucks an hour when I was 14 years old, like it's hard to afford a daily habit. So I, st so I started to sell a little bit on the side to, to support that. And on my <laughs> 16th birthday, my mom caught me selling a little bit of pot to, to, I think it was like my neighbor or something I was weighing it out for and immediately kicked me out of her house. And at that up to that point, you know, the my relationship with my mom had become strained. And I always was closer to my mom growing up. My dad and I have never have had a hard time always seeing eye to eye. Our relationship today is much better than where it was, but you know, I got far I got um along far greater with my mom than I did my dad. So when she kicked me out, um I felt so abandoned, I felt betrayed, all these normal feelings that like, like a teenager would feel when this when this happens. Now, as I look back, I think she obviously did the best she could in that situation. I don't think she was purposely like, I want to ca cause as much pain and harm to Doug as possible, right? I think in some context, I got a little bit of what I deserve um, just by the way I was acting out. I mean, I had a party while she was in the hospital. I was just horrible to her in the way I treated her. So I'm kicked out, shipped to my dad's house to live there full time. He lived about 30 minutes away, changed high schools within 24 hours, thinking that that would forced me to change my friends, change my habits, change my behaviors and become like a better version of myself. Well, it went the opposite way, as you can expect. More trauma, more pain, more what's wrong with me. And it stacked up. And I got to this new school and still kept smoking weed, found new people to get high with, um, still kept selling a little bit to, to fit in, be the cool kid. Like I was, honestly, people thought I was a narc when I first came to the new, <laughs> the new high school because I wanted to fit in as fast as I could. And I knew um, that, the way for me to fit in was to sell drugs and do drugs. So I immediately went up to the kids that I thought might have been smoking or getting high. I'm like, hey, you want to buy some pot? And so it's kind of like the new person when they come in saying that it's like a red flag almost to be a narc. And a narc, for people who don't know what that means, is it's just pretty much a spy for the cops to know who's you know dealing and using drugs. And so my... Um, my volatile behavior continued through through school, barely graduated because all my friends and I would do was ride around, smoke pot, listen to music, and that was our life. We cut class, and I barely graduated. And then as soon as I graduate, you know, it's like I not I only graduated from school. I graduated in the drug class too because I started to move more weight. I started picking up pounds of pot, and and now I'm meeting more people who were doing drugs, not just drugs, but harder drugs. So I got introduced to coke like shortly after I graduated high school. And I remember the, vividly the first time I got Coke, where I remember I was picking up a bunch of pot from this kid. He's like, hey, man, I got a little bit of Coke. You want some? And my gut was like, dude, stay far away. But of course, like my heart and wanting to fit in was like, go, Doug, go all in. So I took a little bit 
and riding around with some of my friends and we're, we're getting high, we're smoking weed. And I'm like, Hey, like I got some Coke. And, and I was somewhat ashamed because like, once you transition, as you know, into the hard drugs, it's a whole nother ball game and ended up cutting up a line for some of my friends and they were into it. We did it. And, and that started another addiction. So again, the same kind of thing that happened with the pot where it started off smoking, um, you know, one hit at a time was what with the Coke was one line then two lines and three lines. And then I built a tolerance to that. And then I'm doing like a gram a day. Then I'm doing an eight ball a day. And so I'm like, I guess I'm right around maybe 17, 18 years old, 18, maybe gosh, right around 18. And the problem that I had was, was Coke and all the anxiety that I had went about as well together as like trying to lose weight and eat pizza every day. It just didn't work. So I started getting massive panic attacks, panic attacks to the point where um, I went to the, the emergency room and there was one night where I was high on Coke. My face was numb, like the whole nine yards as far as being high on Coke, smoking cigarettes. I was eating poorly, high on weed, had all this pot in my car and my heart started racing. My face went numb. My arms started hurting. I started just not being able to breathe and I thought I was having a heart attack. And at the time, I, I literally could have believed that I, that I was going through that because some of my friends had died at that point. Like people we had hung, out, hung around with had died in drinking and driving accidents or overdoses or other substance related issues. And so I was sleeping on one of my friend's couches at this point because I'd been kicked out of both of my houses. You know, my mom's when I was 16 and my dad, you know, right after I graduated high school. And I run into the house and this is where things really changed with my addiction. And I run, I'm like, I'm dying, I'm dying. My friend's mom's like, are you, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm dying. I was like, I need to go to the hospital. She, she drives me to the emergency room. I run to the emergency room, screaming, help, help, I'm dying. And I, and I literally, th I thought I was. And um, they're like, sir, sit down. You're not dying. Like, what drugs are you on? I'm like, I'm not on any drugs. I'm literally dying. And I was having a panic attack, a full-blown panic attack. And back then, this is like in their mid-2000s or whatever, nobody talked about mental health. Nobody before, talked. That's before panic attacks were trendy. Right. Yeah, they were. <laughs> yeah. Nobody was talking about it. And I had no idea that, exist it existed and you know ended up buying like a book on how to navigate panic attacks thinking that would help went to some therapy it just didn't because i was still using the drugs again you would think this this point in my life would be like hey doug stop with the drugs change your friends change your habits turn turn your life around look where your life's headed you're in the emergency room thinking you're dying and i needed to do what see I think what happens is when your family dynamic is broken people will cling to whatever they can to find a sense of community and that's what I did with my friends. And not that my friends are terrible people. We just engaged in bad habits. And I became a creature of my environment. So I, I felt for me to survive, it was, I needed to survive. I needed to have my friends more as a, as a, as a mode of survival than to stop doing the drugs. So even though I would get panic attacks then from then, from then on, from doing Coke and smoking pot, because then I started to get paranoid when I would smoke weed because I just... I was smoking so much. I mean, I smoked like a quarter ounce a day. That Rastafari. Yeah, exactly. And that what ended up happening was I, I, I got so embarrassed to be around my friends at this point because I would literally have to pull the car over if I was high because I was paranoid and having a panic attack that one day I was at um, a friend of mine's house and he offered me a five milligram Percocet and, he took, and I took it. And the same monkey that came off my back that came off my back when I first started smoking pot, came off my back again with the Percocet. And that's where things really just downhill super fast. And what I've realized is this, is I didn't realize how addictive these painkillers were. And again, I'm not blaming anybody for my problems with myself. I knew I wasn't putting kale in my system or spinach, but I didn't understand how quick you become addicted to, to opiates. And so five milligrams very quickly turn into 10 a day, 20, 40, all the way up until I'm snorting three, 400 milligrams of Oxycontin up my nose every single day to support my habit. Half my left nostril is missing. Um, and I thought my, my life was, was over. I thought I was going to die doing drugs because very similarly to you, we kind of idolized like the people who died at 27. There was that poster I remember as a kid with the four or five rock stars or whatever that all died. When they were 27 and my friends would, I would often joke and say, well, if we can't hi get high and, and party anymore, like what's the point of living? And I was spending several hundred hours a day on pills. And one of my, at the time, one of my greatest, what I thought was my greatest setback became my biggest blessing. And on Cinco de Mayo of 2008, 20 years old, I'm riding around with a few of my friends and make a drug deal. 
I had a half a pound of pot in my trunk. I had $2,000 in cash in the car. And I had a busted headlight that I'd been meaning to fix. And when you're doing drugs and when you're in the depths of addiction, all you care about is who you're getting high with, how you're scoring the drugs, what you're doing, what kind of music you're going to listen to, what you're going to eat afterwards because you can't really eat until you're high. That's all that matters. It's, it becomes like an obsession. It's like a ritual, if you will. And so changing my headlight wasn't part of that conversation, even though it should have been because I was riding dirty you know, all around town. And so cops running radar. And so I'm so such a brilliant guy at this time that I decided I'm going to flash my high beams at the cop thinking it would hide the fact that I had a busted headlight. But in reality, it gave him a reason to pull me over. So he pulls me over. I kind of stammered to hand in my license and registration. At this point, my heart's in the, the, the pit of my stomach. I knew it was over. I knew this was it. And one thing leads to the next. He pulls me out of the car, um, puts me in handcuffs. and Or no, he pulls me out of the car, searches the car, finds the half a pound of pot in the trunk, finds the, the money in the glove box, puts me in handcuffs puts me in the back of the cop car and I thought my life was over. Um, I remember just sitting in the back of the cop car and I don't know if anybody listening to this or you, Luke, has had this experience where like everything kind of came to a head for me. I was like, how did all this happen? Because I was like, how did this kid who, who just wanted to be loved, how did this kid who just wanted to fit in, how did this kid who just wanted to be sports, be good at sports, how did he end up in the back of a cop car? Now, you know, I was facing you know, felony drug charges. And every bad choice that I ever made in my life in, re in response to my circumstances just started flashing before me. How I dealt with a divorce, how I dealt with girls rejecting me, how I dealt with being cut, how I dealt with being bullied, how I dealt with everything. And, and I thought that was it. And um, go to jail. I'm charged with a felony. It sounds funny today in 2021 saying felony drug charges with pot. You know, it was the possession with the intent to distribute marijuana, and uh, was it all in one one bag or was it parcel? Yeah, it was all it was oh. all in one bag. Huh. Um, you know, that's how they get you a lot of the time, right? Like you you could have a certain amount of drugs, and if it's all in one cash, yeah, cache maybe is the word. Uh, then you're cool, but if you have a bunch of little bags of the same amount, then it's intent to sell, and you know all that stuff. If you're someone that struggles with quality of sleep or duration of sleep, your problem might just be light leaking in and informing your brain that it's time to wake up, especially that pesky blue light that might sneak through the windows from street lights outside or any devices you have plugged in in the room. Fact is, your body needs complete darkness if you want to get great sleep. Now, it's not always possible to adjust the room you're in so that it's completely blacked out. So this company called blueblocks.com has solved that problem by creating an incredible sleep mask called the Remedy Sleep Mask. Now, unlike other sleep masks on the market or one you might just pick up randomly on Amazon, this thing is 100% blackout. So it's like sleeping in pitch black darkness, which is what you want. It's also really soft on your face, very comfortable. You can also fully open your eyes while wearing the mask. So this is great people with long eyelashes and also apply zero pressure to the eyes, which I find to be really annoying. I don't want my eyes being smashed when I'm trying to sleep. It's made with super breathable fabric so you don't wake up with a hot and sweaty face. It's also got an adjustable strap, which is really cool. So you can fit it to whatever size your skull happens to be. It also has adjustable eye cups so you can position them on your face for the perfect fit. Another thing that's really cool is it works for all sleeping styles. So if you sleep on your back, belly, or even on your side, it's flat on the side so it doesn't smash your face and ruin your sleep, which again is the whole point of this thing. So if you're looking for better sleep, if you're waking up frequently, if you're shifting around at night because some light is sneaking through, this can solve that problem. And not only is it good for sleep, I happen to like it a lot for taking a nap during the day or even for meditation, which of course has many benefits, one of which being helping you sleep the following night. So the Remedy Sleep Mask from Blue Blocks is awesome. I highly recommend you check it out. Here's how you do so. Go to blueblocks.com slash lifestylist and use the code lifestylist to save 15%. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. Lifestylist is also the code for 15% off. Well, it was that and then I... <laughs> Of course, I did. So I did the, a few cardinal sins when it came to selling drugs. Number one, I was riding with a lot of um, 
supply, like riding dirty with my own supply, right? Had a scale in the car. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that that was, you know, a big factor. And then I had a ton of money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I think, and I think also from what I understand, people knew me around town. I mean, I've been selling pot for, for years. It wasn't just like I just started like the month before. What town was this? So I was in Hartford County. I was, it was in, in, I was intermittently traveling between Baltimore and Hartford County. So I was in Hartford County is where I got arrested, which was a more conservative county in the state of Maryland. So a lot of that stuff was heavily frowned upon. Mm-hmm. And, but for me, like I didn't care. Like, I mean, the risk, it was like, oh, whatever. I'll never get caught. It'll never happen to me. They'll let me off easy if I do or whatever. Or I'll eventually just stop because I wanted to stop just like you. I wanted to stop. There were so many times I would wake up and I'd have to literally snort, you know, 150, 160 milligrams of oxy just to function. And I was like, I just want this to go away. I would just wish I could get a clean slate and just wake up tomorrow and not be addicted to drugs, not sell drugs be financially secure so I wouldn't have to do this, have good relationships. I wish this would all go away. But the problem is, you know, it was almost like me thinking this was being in this like really good dream. And then you wake up and like, here you are, this is reality. And so um, I got charged. A few months later, I go to court, which have happened to be September, September of 2008. And you would have thought that, again, I would have made some simple steps to change my life, look good for the judge because I was facing, you know, I've been arrested on face on uh, felony drug charges and potentially could have go, could go to jail if I didn't clean my act up. And I didn't. Went to court and the judge sentenced me to five years in jail, but suspended everything but 90 days. So for those listening who aren't familiar with the judicial system, it means that he suspended everything from the five years except for the 90-day sentence. And if I messed up, I failed a drug test, if I didn't show up to probation, if I got another charge, if violated any of the rules, I could potentially go back and serve the full five years. Give me five years probation, 200 hours community service, all kinds of fines and drug classes. But he looked at me, he's like, Doug, you're 20 years old. This felony conviction is going to haunt you the rest of your life because he also found me guilty of the, the felony. He's like, because back in 2008, it was much more stigmatized to be a convicted felon, especially of drugs, right? He's like, but I'm going to cut you a break. And I'm like, break? After you just telling me what you just told me, that's a break. He's like, if you complete everything without messing up, no missed probation appointments, no failed drug tests, you do your community service, you do all that, I'll take the felony conviction off your record at the end of the five years of probation. I'm like, all right, man, whatever. Like, I didn't think I was going to live to see my 25th birthday because like I had said, I'd been to several funerals of people I hung out with, not just like people I might have seen on Facebook or people that I might have heard about through the grapevine, like people I knew. And so my my faith not in in living was not was nothing zilch. So I was like, all right, man, whatever. So it gives me a few weeks to to gather my belongings, and I ended up reporting to jail three weeks later, which ironically was a week after my twenty first birthday. And <clears throat> what's crazy, the craziest part of this whole thing, is when I walked through the gates of this detention center, I cried because I didn't want to go in. But when I left. I cried because I didn't want to leave. And here's what happened. So mind you, I'm incredibly terrified. I'm scared, anxious, fearful. Every like, you know, thing you think about what, what happens in jail was going through my mind, especially from the kid who was so unhealthy, uncoordinated, super unconfident. I was like, man, I am freaking done. Plus I had a horrific opiate addiction to kick. So I walk into the detention center and then the first thing, obviously, that happened was I detoxed cold turkey from the, from the oxy, which for those who aren't familiar with that, it's like having the worst case of the flu, like uncontrollable bowel movements, you're vomiting, insomnia, anxiety, pain, like depression, like sleepless nights, you name it. But the worst thing, I think, for me was this feeling of trying to crawl out of your own skin. But as I look back, it was almost like the old me was trying to crawl out of, the, tr- tr- the old me was like kind of being like, you know, it was the old me was essentially disappearing so the new the new me could come out and appear and my soon to be cellmate was sitting at the scrabble table playing scrabble and he looks at me and he could just tell my shoulders were all rounded forward i was very quiet and soft spoken and he could just tell either there was something kind of off with my demeanor he was like what are you in here for and i kind of told him a little bit about what i was doing and he's like okay he's like you're gonna start working out with me when you get through your detox and I'm like, dude, have you seen me? Like, I could have been a model for Pillsbury. 
Like, there's <laughs> no way I'm working out with you. And I like to describe him as like a more jacked version of Brad Pitt from Fight Club. Because I've been a trainer now for over 10 years, and he's still to this day like either the most or one of the most jacked people I've ever met. And that night, it was the night after, he was doing like thousands of push-ups, pull-ups, running all kinds of laps in the gym, and climbing the the like the there's like not fencing but there's like these bars in the in the jail common area and I'm like who is this guy like for hours because that's how you know people what people would do to kind of kill time and so you know a few days later we're kind of having this conversation and he's like asking me what I'm in there for like what happened to me and I'm like oh my divorce or my parents got divorced and the kids picked on me and the girls and can I cuss on here yeah all you want all right and he looks at me and he goes quit being a bitch and you know where i come from or in jail like you don't want to be called that right but while many people there's some people i'm sure that might not relate to this or might find it offensive and i understand that but the context of this is what's important he said you're blaming everybody for your problems but yourself he's like there's plenty of people whose parents get divorced there's plenty of people who get bullied there's plenty of people this and that and they're not in jail He's like, you chose to respond in the way you did, and now you're here. And I was like, huh. And it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but Luke, it was what I needed to hear. Because my logical mind had come back a little bit, and I was like, huh. Up until this point, I'd had like 20 or 21 jobs by the time I was 21. I damaged so many relationships. I was a drug addict. I'm in jail for felony drug charges. So clearly, the way that I was choosing and blaming everybody for my problems wasn't working. And he had he was somebody who had no skin in the game. He was giving me this advice and he, he wasn't like my close friend. He wasn't anybody in my family. He wasn't like a probation officer. He was just a person I met in jail. And I felt empowered in that moment. Like I felt f- finally for the first time that I needed to do something about it because he said to me, he's like, you can be a man or you can be a bitch. He's like, you can be a bitch go cry in the corner, say, woe is me, and blame everybody for your problems. Like Most people will do that when they're faced with stuff like this. Or is it, you can be a man, look at yourself in the mirror and say, you got yourself here. And the only way for you to get out of this is for you to, to move forward. You know? And then that's the context that I think it's important for people to understand, because that's life. Like No matter what you're going through, like circumstances are terrible, and there's a lot of things that people go through that are horrific and horrible. And I get that. But what I also know is that if you play the victim and you blame other people for your, your problems and you blame people for your actions, it makes the situation a lot worse. And it did for me because I went from just the kid who was having the problems I did to now I'm in jail. And so I decided to give working out a try. <laughs> it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. But um, I did it and I remember getting down and do a push up. Couldn't do a push up, couldn't even do one from my knees. And could barely walk up, walk up and down the stairs because I was smoking cigarettes, you know, um, before I went to jail. And I, I remember saying to him, and this was something else that was important to me that people, again, I mean, if you find this offensive, I'm, it's just, just, this is just, you have to find what drives you. That's what I've learned. This is something that drove me. As I said, why can't I do a push up? He's like, because you're fat. And he's like, you're freaking fat. He's like, I don't know how else to describe it. And I'm like, looking at him, he's like, I don't know what else to say to, say to you. He's like, you got belly fat around your core. Your core is weak. You're, you're, it's not, you're not able to hold yourself up. And I hated that word. I hated being told that I was fat. And I swore to myself I would never be called fat again. And that was one of the bigger, big drivers for me. So we set a goal in jail. Again, this sounds kind of crazy to do a set of 10 push-ups and run a mile by the time I left my 90-day sentence. And, and what happened from there was magical. He trained me in there during my sentence for... And, um, and with his motivation and encouragement and holding me accountable, I was able to do it. I was able to, to run that mile and do that set of 10 pushups. And I felt this light bulb go off in my head that I was finally ready to take control of my life and change. I felt this sense of accomplishment I never had, this sense of discipline. I felt that I finally was able to get comfortable with the Doug Bobst, um, in the most naked way possible. I was finally able to get comfortable being uncomfortable because all the masks came off. I was faced to be as naked as possible, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And it was just me versus me. And I learned to, to reattach behavior to emotion. And that's what gets people, I think, twisted too, is like when they get into recovery, 
they don't find new coping strategies to deal with the emotions. The emotions are still there. I got news for you. When you stop using drugs, things get a lot harder before they get easier, right? And I was lucky that if I didn't manage my emotions in a healthy way, I would have gotten my butt kicked. I would have ended up in solitary confinement or worse or whatever. But I was forced to change the way I talked to myself. I was forced to change my perspective. I mean, one of the things that was hardest for me was my freedom being taken away. I couldn't talk to who I wanted to. I couldn't go where I wanted. Couldn't eat what I wanted. Yeah, I couldn't do all that. And I, and, I, and I gained a lot of understanding on the importance of just being thankful for the small things when I was in there. And so the day I left, I was very emotional. I cried. And I said to my, to my cellmate, I was like, how can I ever repay you? And he said, pay it forward and don't mess up. I, I had no idea what paying it forward meant. I never read a personal development book in my life. I was like, all right, man. And he gave me a workout plan that I still have framed in my place today. So I never forget where I came from. I got I to gotta interject. Yeah. There's a lot of points I've wanted yeah. to, but I've, Go ahead. I've withheld because it's a great story. Yeah. What Do you know where this Brad Pitt Yoda of jail is? <laughs> yeah. It's, is that guy, are you in contact with him? I, I have been through the years. And, and the funny thing is after I got out, him and I had done some workouts together and it wasn't my like baseline level novice workout that we were doing in jail. It was me keeping up with him. And then we wrote, you know, exchanged some letters back and forth and have had some conversations, but um, we've kind of lost touch a little bit. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where he is as, as far as like what he's got going on, but um, there's never a day that goes by where I don't think about like what he did for me. I dedicated my first book to him and you know, he saved my life. And it, it opened up really my, uh, my gaze, if you will, to the importance of, of spirituality. It helped to kind of start that, I think, and paying it forward and being of service and passing the torch and saying, you know, there was a reason that I was in jail when I was. There's a reason that he was there when he was there. And he taught me all these lessons that I've now been able to carry forth with me and today, carry forth with me today and um, and help other people just through fitness and other things. But I think the other thing too is, you know, sometimes Luke, when you, you're so face down in the freaking mud and you can't see what's in front of you because life's a freaking mess and there's so much chaos around you, you can't see any light. And I think what he did for me was he pulled the back of my head up just a little bit so I could see just a glimpse of light. And then once I saw there was light, just my natural ability you know, as a human to want to be happy was like, just go and go and just keep moving one step at a time. And part of me, frankly, when I left jail, like most of me, I should say, doubted myself because up until that point, without the help of my cellmate, I'd failed miserably in every aspect of life. But I knew that if I focused solely on that, I was going to lose. I was going to fail. And that's what happens to people is, and I know it sounds cliche to focus on the positives and be optimistic. And I get that. But what I am saying is that if you focus solely on the shit in your life and all this stuff that's gone wrong, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be fearful. Your, conf your confidence is going to be in the shitter. And I knew the only shot that I had, the only shot was to legitimately lean into this blind faith and knowing that I could be relentless with everything in my life about becoming the best version of myself, following everything that I knew that would help me become better just one day at a time. Like, and, I, and it's funny because I didn't go to A or NA, but this was just something that was ingrained in me through my cellmate of just controlling what's in front of me. And I knew that if I worked out, I knew that if I ate right, I knew that if I you know, stayed away from certain things, if I had a positive outlook, if I was just looking towards the future, it gave me a chance, not a, not guarantee, but it gave me an opportunity to stay in the game. And also like, and I'll, I'll kind of like wrap this up with this and then we can go on was one of the things that I learned early on is that it's a freaking journey because we were in the cell one night and while recovery and, you know, beating addiction was very important to me. The other thing that I was really self-conscious of was my weight. I mean, I was just a doughy kid, you know, I was just fat. And I said, how long is it going to take for me to lose this weight? He's like, how long have you been beating your body up for? And I forget what I said. I mean, I'm like a long, I'm like a long time or something like that. He's like, it's going to take a long time for you to lose weight. And that stuck with me. So I knew it was, there was a process where it wasn't going to happen overnight. 
Because in addiction or as an addict, you're so used to responding impulsively that with that mindset, I think a lot of people have a hard time transitioning when they get into recovery to knowing that it's going to take a long time to heal a lot of the crap that you were dealing with before. I think most people listening to this podcast on a regular basis are well aware of the benefits of CBD for doing things like reducing inflammation, muscle recovery, anti-anxiety, stress support, and of course, sleep support. In fact, I've been using CBD products for sleep for a number of years, and I found it to be one of the most effective things you can do. The problem is, is that the CBD market is very saturated and there's lots of noise, so it's tough to find a reliable product. That's why I'm behind Eaton Hemp because their CBD is USDA certified organic. In fact, they were one of the first on the market to produce CBD in this way. And this is really important because the hemp plant is a phytoremediator, which means it sucks up all the nutrients from the soil. Now, the problem with that is it also sucks up all of the toxins and heavy metals. So if your CBD is not grown organically, you're actually getting a concentrated shot of metals, pesticides, and any other junk that happens to be in the soil. And many people aren't even aware of this. Now, if it's organic, you get all the goodness of that clean soil. Eaton Hemp CBD is minimally processed and infused with their own organic hemp seed oil grown on their farm in upstate New York. So I love this product. I use it every day. They have a really strong version that is absolutely incredible for sleep. If you're ready to check it out, it's super simple. Go to eatonhemp.com. That's E A T. O-N-H-E-M-P, eatonhemp.com. And if you use the code Luke, you're going to save 20% off. That's Luke for 20% off at eatonhemp.com. I want to go back to, uh, thank you for, for this story. It's captivating to say the least and addresses my probably number one core fear outside of just death itself, <laughs> and that is being incarcerated. Uh, I only... I only went to jail once and uh, I was only in there for a few hours, thankfully. Yeah. But, uh, but I've almost followed in your footsteps on a number of occasions, but going back to, you know, the earlier part of the story where you start to smoke weed and you're able to feel comfortable doing that. And then you start smoking more weed and then you try a little Coke, then the Percocet, then the Oxys. I remember being a kid and there was a lot of propaganda kind of in the eighties, the just say no ear and all this stuff, right. Where, uh, they called, uh, marijuana, a gateway drug. And I always thought, Oh, that's so stupid. No, it's not. I just want to smoke weed and listen to, you know, my rock and roll. And (laughs) for me, it always actually was a gateway drug. Like anytime I attempted to stop drinking or doing hard drugs, I could hang in there for a little bit. But I could never quit smoking weed. It was incredibly addictive to me. Mm. And anytime I would have a little bit of quasi clean time, I never quit smoking weed because I couldn't. It was the hardest thing for me. And then when I smoked weed, then it it would open up the floodgates for all of the other stuff. And I think it's interesting now in the health and wellness space that you and I both share a career in, 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 in in different capacities. Um, I don't, I don't know what to think about cannabis exactly yeah. now because I can only see my subjective experience. And I had to quit smoking weed 100% in order to get sober off all the other stuff that was much yeah. more life-threatening, you know? So I don't know if there's a question there. It's sort of just an examination of this plant that I, is a plant medicine that has so much value. I mean, I do all kinds of different CBD things, sometimes even a like a tincture with THC and uh, CBD, but not... Right. Like to a psychoactive dose where I'm stoned, but just for sleep and things like that. So I use the plant and I think the plant has an immense value, but uh, I don't think it's as innocent as many people think it is. Like it's just natural. It's just a plant. But I mean, it really devastated my childhood and prevented me from being able to get sober off all the other stuff because I just was so addicted to it psychologically. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, for the longest time, I thought it was a gateway drug for me as well. And while I kind of still, there's part of me that obviously still believes that, I think there was also a lot of gateway trauma 
that led me to that. Yeah. I often wonder yeah. if I didn't have the trauma, would I have fallen down that same path? I don't know. And I don't want to, I, I don't think it serves any real purpose to try to figure that out because it's irrelevant because that's not what happened. Right. But yeah, I mean, I, with anything, you just got to, I, I always say like, well, why are you doing it? Like, what's the reason? And I think people need to understand if they do have some trauma, they do have some stuff that they haven't dealt with or they have crippling anxiety or depression or insomnia or whatever, it's a slippery slope because that sense of euphoria, that sense of like that like bear hug you feel when you're under the influence of one of these substances to be able to be yourself is addicting. And that's the problem. More the experience yeah. that you have than the actual substance, yeah. Yeah, because it's not like, I mean, I've said this before. It's not like I love the taste of pot. No, uh, I did. Yeah, I still do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the I guy. Don't... Like, I walk by someone blazing weed, and I'm like, mm, <laughs> oh, that smells good. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I, I love it. I've been in weed stores a few times just because I'm curious. I'm like kind of jealous of the people that yeah. still get to go there and like yeah. enjoy their cannabis when I. Well, I, not like I really want to, but it's off the menu for me. But I go right. in there, I'm like, oh my God, I wish this was here when I was 20. Yeah. So yeah, I do. But anyway. Oh no, it's, but I became addicted to the experience of how it made me feel in that moment. Yeah, yeah. And that's what can be hard because then, you know, you start to develop a tolerance and you're doing more. And then sure enough, like you're, you're not even aware because a lot of times what happens is like there's something that goes on in your mind where your mind gets hijacked and now your sense of pleasure, your identity, and how you feel about yourself is now wrapped up and tied to getting high. And so you've kind of lost touch. In many cases, again, not with that, just in my own experience, you lose touch with the things in life that are healthy that give you pleasure. The things that, you know, if you weren't under the influence of a drug would be meaningful to you. And that's the problem. And I think what also happens is because you're, you know, numbing yourself with with a substance your decision making um falters <laughs> right yeah you're you're develop a new normal right yeah. because i think your environment can create a false sense of normalcy so if you're around you know 10 15 people and all you're doing is smoking weed and listening to to you know you're li- getting high hey, listening to music again not that there's anything wrong with that but this is your life you're eating fast food you're just talking about like nothing. You're not being productive. That's normal now for you. You you become that. And so then let's just say the same friend group, two months down, now you start snorting a little bit of Coke. Everybody else around you is doing it. It's normal for you. And then you can see where I'm going with this. And eventually yeah. maybe it's pills, maybe it's heroin or, or worse, God forbid. Because that's normal for you. Where... Like, it's just kind of like when I use this analogy a lot, it's this that when, say you have somebody, I'll use me for, say I was somebody that had a drinking problem. I was at the bar every day from like nine in the morning till five at night, every single day, getting hammered, coming home and say I'm married. Say my spouse is like, Doug, you have a problem. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't have a problem. Everybody else is doing it because everybody else is doing it. Everybody else has a drinking problem. But when you're in that moment, you can't see outside of that because all you're focused on. And so environment is everything. And, the, and the, the, the other thing that can be really cool about your environment too is like the space we play in when you're around a bunch of people that are doing stuff like this where you're focused on health, you're focused on wellness, you're focused on helping other people and bettering yourself, that becomes your normal too. So you learn not to tolerate other stuff that, may, might, that might bring you down. So that's why I say it's a slippery slope. Because there's very there's a lot of factors that can play into it. What's your what's your friend group look like? What's your life like? Are you really happy with who you are without the drug? Like, are you happy with the direction your life's headed? How are your relationships? How is your job? I mean, how's your job? Are you still like excited about life? There's so much more that goes into it than just saying, "Oh, I'm just going to start smoking weed because it's now legal." It's not that simple. Because think about some of the other stuff that's legal: processed food cigarettes, alcohol. Those three things are legal. You can buy them whenever you want if you're 18 years old and 21 if you're to buy alcohol. Anyone can do it. And it's 
every in every state you know these things exist so it's not even like everywhere so i invite people to not necessarily equate being legal with being the best decision for them again if i'm not who am i to say what you should or shouldn't do i'm just speaking from my own personal experience and the experiences that i've talked with other people about and just knowing that you have to do what works for you like do what works for you whatever you're doing in life i don't care drug or non-drug related make sure it aligns with like who you are at your core and know that like develop a sense of awareness about who you are as a person because i think if you don't you'll start to cling and fill use other people's identity to fill yourself up because you don't have your own sense of self that's why i think getting a baseline in recovery and doing the work and trying to figure out why you were using the drugs in the first place or abusing alcohol or whatever it was is so important paramount it's crucial so that you don't fall down the depths of addiction later on in life because you know you weren't able to cope with some of the stuff that you should have dealt with when you first got into recovery on the weed thing it's it is an important distinction around you know why you're doing it yeah. right yeah and i you know what comes to mind is that i have a few friends that uh, use cannabis recreationally and are still thriving yeah. and living their best life. And it doesn't escalate to drinking all the time or doing Percocet or Coke. I, they're just, they would never, they'd be like, ew, gross. I don't right. do that stuff. But they're able to use it medicinally. And I think it's, it's probably true of most substances. I mean, I don't know anyone that is really happy and successful and does recreational crystal meth, heroin, Coke. I mean, there are things that I think like, Everyone would kind of agree are probably not a great idea to do yeah. on a regular basis, if ever. But, uh, you know, with the the weed, it's kind of um, the intentionality of it. And as you said, having the ability to be introspective and being honest with yourself, right? It's, yeah. not a, it's not like a moral to me, whether someone does drugs or not. A, it's totally not my business. Right. And like you're so eloquently stating, this is just your own journey. But in the interest of those listening and finding value in a conversation around this topic, it is really an individual thing. And the only one uh, of any of us that can determine whether or not our behavior is adding to the value of our life and the lives of those with whom we relate or not is the ability to be honest with yourself, right? To really look in the mirror and go, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm knowingly just going off the rails a little here. And I do this sometimes, not with drugs, but I mean, just with, I might do something that's a bit extreme. So my biohacking stuff or whatever. And I'm like, all right, I'm getting a little far out here, <laughs> but I'm aware of it. And I'm willing to go there because I want to see what happens, you know, or I'm experimenting for the betterment of my fellow humans because I want to find something out about something. Right. Uh, but, you know, cannabis in itself is kind of its own unique thing because it is, totally natural and requires no processing other than cooking it or smoking it, right? It's just, it's a nature created substance. And in terms of whether or not it's addictive or not, as you said, also, I think it depends a lot on what someone's prior experience is. In other words, if you don't have any emotional baggage or trauma that you're trying to run from, the likelihood of you becoming addicted to weed is much lower than someone who's had a really rough life and gets that sense of relief and that, yeah. that bear hug experience that you um, explained. Well, really quick, I yeah. think, I, I mean, I might be butchering this. I think the, the way addiction is defined, I think, is continued use despite adverse consequences, you know, despite negative side effects. So I think, again, it's like... By that metric, I'm definitely addicted to my phone. <laughs> well, I think we all are, but I think... This is where <laughs> this is where it can be helpful, I think, for those listening, because I think obviously pot's a thing. You have to ask yourself, is it negatively impacting your life? Right? Like, sure, there's plenty of people that can drink socially and not have adverse effects. There's plenty of people that can smoke pot and not have adverse effects. There's plenty of people that can frankly, I'm sure, eat get away with eating some processed food and not have adverse effects, right? But it, it all comes down to you. Like, how are your relationships? Are you having to, to smoke every, are you having to eat in order to get hungry? Like I was like, I couldn't go anywhere without being high. I, I felt like almost just weird. If I could, if I, even if I was going to a sporting event, I don't care if I was going to 
my family's house for the holidays. I couldn't do anything without being high. Oh, no way. Right? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Go somewhere sober? <laughs> yeah. Hell no. <laughs> no way. If you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, you should know that it would not be possible without support from our friends over at Beekeepers Naturals. Now, when I sat down to cut this run of 2021 ads, I thought, which one do I want to start with? And it immediately came to mind that I use the Propolis Throat Spray more often than any of their other amazing products, as delicious and useful as they are. I always travel with the throat spray. I use it on airplanes, anywhere I'm going to be around other people's funk, when the air is dirty and germy. And I also keep it by my bedside to use first thing in the morning when I wake up, especially in dry climates where I get a little bit of sore throat, or if I'm just feeling like a twinge of a cold or something like that possibly coming on. The Propolis Throat Spray is not only a powerful natural medicine, but it also tastes delicious. It's kind of like a mild honey flavor. In fact, it's so delicious that my fiance Allison saw me using this stuff so often that eventually she jacked a bottle of it for herself because there's a few around the house. She's free to do so, of course. And now she's on board with it and she travels with it as well. So it is a family favorite. These little bee creatures make some incredible stuff and bee propolis is one of my favorites. It delivers natural germ-fighting properties and antioxidants to help protect our bodies. It's also sustainably sourced, and this spray is made with just three simple ingredients. So you're never going to find any refined sugars, dyes, dirty chemical, none of that swag ever. So if you're ready to check out the Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray, here's what you do. Go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash lukestory. That's beekeepersnaturals.com slash lukestory. The spelling is B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R- S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S, beekeepersnaturals.com slash Luke Story. And if you use that link, which of course is also easily clickable in the show notes for this episode, you're going to save yourself 15% off. I remember I used to wake up in the middle of the night, like to go to the bathroom and I would get high just to go back to bed. Me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's like... There's, I, I literally like the goal was to not have a sober breath ever. And I was very successful at it. I'm um, going back to yeah. the, to the opiates. Cause you, you, you said something there that I, I kind of forgot about. And I think this would be helpful for anyone that's, you know, still recreationally doing drugs and yeah. like, ah, these guys are nerds. I got this. This is never going to happen to me. Um, with opiates specifically, and I was never huge into pills. We didn't have Oxycontin back, back in the old days when I was <laughs> doing drugs, we just had pure heroin. Uh, but I remember when I first started doing heroin, it was like, A, there was this cool mystique around it. It wasn't, I don't know, to me, I thought it was, to be, I'm going to be honest, I thought it was like cool. And I remember when I was going to move to Hollywood when I was 19, I'd never done it. You know, yeah. I'd done all these other drugs, but I was like, man, when I get to LA, I'm going to find me some heroin. I want to be like Keith Richards, you know, like I want to be like William Burroughs. I want to be cool. I'm going to do a cool drug. And it's so, and I'm sure this is true with the, you know, the synthetic pharmaceutical opiates, but what you said about you're addicted before you even know it. Yeah. We used to do this thing, we call it chipping, you know, which is like, you just do it here and there every once in a while. And me and my little drug buddies, when we started doing that stuff, it seemed like it was every once in a while, mm. you know? And then it was like, one day I just woke up and was like, I had, I was dope sick and I knew what it was. I yeah. was like, I need some of that stuff. And I'm like, what, wait, what just happened? It was just, it was like I had been in a dream or something. And all of a sudden, like now I'm actually a heroin addict. That was not the plan ever. And then each time I would kick uh, and, you know, stop. And then I'm like, I'm never doing that again. And then that insidious thought of like, well, you know, someone's got a little, like you want, you want a little taste. And I'm like, it'll be fine this time. And then maybe I would do it that one night and then a few days would go by. And then, I don't know, again, you slip back in this dream and then I'm like, I'm back on all day, every day again. It's just with opiates, it's really, really tricky like that because it's, it really does sneak up on you. It's like a, it's like you're out in the sea and a shark starts kind of nibbling at your toe and you're like, that doesn't really hurt. Next thing you know, you are in its mouth, <laughs> you know, being dragged under and it's too late. Like it's got you. It's well, just, it's really spooky. The crazy and unique thing about opiates, and I don't know if you experienced this, is that when you do it, 
you have this sense, you have this ritual at first because it be- be- begins with, at least for me, you, you know, I mean, I talked about the five milligram Percocet, but when you actually get like an Oxycontin, so Oxycontin for those listening who aren't as familiar with it, maybe because I think, I mean, I think they've tried it to get a lot of them off the streets. I know they've cracked down on doctors and that's, I'm sure contributed obviously to the increased heroin use, but Oxycontin, you would get these pills and on one side it would have an OC and on the other side it would have the milligram. So they would have tens that were, I believe, white. So it would have OC and then a 10, 20s, which um, were pink. No. Yeah, 20s that were pink. Then you would have 40s that were orange. Then you have 60s that were red. Like Skittles. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you would have 80s, which were like, the cream of the crop. Those are black. Yeah, the no, black they, no <laughs> they, they were gr- they were like this green, with eighty on one side and then OC on the other. So when we would pick up like an eighty milligram, which was the more common ones for us back in the day, um, we would just cut it up. We might split it with a friend or split it amongst four of us, where we would each snort like twenty milligrams or each snort forty or whatever. And it becomes like this ritual. But then what it also does when you snort it, that's why it's so dangerous. Is you get this feeling of euphoria. Like, wow, this is awesome. Like, I love this. And then there's this sense of peace it also brings you where you're able to numb the pain. Where Coke doesn't really do that. You get this massive euphoric rush when you snort Coke, but you're like, you know, you're jacked up. You're not like numbing the pain, right? I mean, hence why Oxycontin's a painkiller because I don't, be- I believe it, it, it numbs emotional and mental pain just as much as it does as physical pain. And, and you know, you'd always look at like people who are homeless and be like, oh, that'll never be me. Like, those are the real bad addicts. But then you come to realize that you're the same person and addiction doesn't discriminate. And, and, and there's a time where, and I say this a lot because I, I think there's a lot of truth to this, where initially you do drugs. I don't care if it's pot. I don't care if it's Coke. I don't care if it's Oxy or heroin, where there's this novelty to it. And you're you're doing it with your friends, and you're listening to music, and you're like, man, I'm you know you you alluded to Keith Richards or Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain or Janis Joplin or whatever, and then like somehow the the line gets crossed where now it's not the ritual, it's survival, and you're doing it to numb the shame, you're doing it to be healthy. I mean, healthy in, in the sense where you have you you need to be able to get out of bed, or you need to not be sick. Or you need to be able to, to show up to a family gathering and you're so ashamed of who you are, you can't go there sober because if you're sober, like all hell is going to break loose inside of your mind because you're not comfortable in your own skin. And, and so with opiates, it, it was incredibly challenging to kind of catch your breath, if you will, because it just everything happened so fast. Like my stint with opiates wasn't that long. I mean, I think maybe it was two, three years, maybe if that, but it was in 10 intense, two to three years. And, and as I look back, there was definitely times. And I think I've, I said this where I wanted to stop. Like I wanted to, like there was times where I was like, man, like I just, I wish I could just stop doing the drugs. But the problem was I didn't know how I would find different friends. The problem was I didn't know how I was going to deal with my shit. The problem was I damaged every relationship up until that point. And I just said, well, what's the point? And I literally would get to the point where I would, you know, I would literally like look at a line of like Coke and Oxy because I would mix that too. And I'd be like, I wonder if I snorted this, if, if I would wake up, like what would happen when people miss me? Like I started asking these questions and I never like tried to commit suicide, but I definitely had thoughts in my mind that, that, that I was like, I wonder if people would miss me. Or I, I sometimes I, I would, would think like, I, I pray that I don't wake up. If I'm going to go out, I might as well go out doing what I loved, and that was drugs, because you become obsessed with it. And you know, people might be like, "Well, you know, just stop." Your brain becomes hijacked. Like that's all my brain knew. And unfortunately for me, and I say this now, I went to jail because it saved my life, and I was taught a lot of the lessons that I learned in jail about dealing with my shit in a good way and that life's not going to be easy and to stop making excuses for my behavior and to, to take care of myself and to stop wanting to, to try to fit in with people just because you think that's the right thing to do. And I, I think 
isolation, you know, as I'm sure we've all experienced during this, during the pandemic has been something that's been really hard for people. And, and for me, it was something that I struggled with as a kid too, because I never wanted to be alone because I wasn't comfortable with myself. And what I learned is that when I intentionally spent time with myself after I got out of jail, like at my grandparents' house who took me in after I, I got out because I wasn't going to stay with my parents. I mean, my mom wouldn't let me back and I didn't want to stay with my dad. And I don't even think he wanted me back in his house. Anyway, um, I learned that I, when I spent time with the same group of friends that I hung out with, I felt alone. It got to a point where the conversations would be awkward. It's almost like a bad first date where there's nothing to talk about because it was just like I was a completely different person. Like I don't, I don't remember who I was before I went to jail. Like the memories are still there, but I can't. It's hard to really get connected to that person because it's just so much had changed. And so I had to make a decision. Like, all right, like, do you want to still hang out with the same group and run the risk of potentially like doing drugs because you're a byproduct of your environment? Or do you want to make a hard choice and make a short-term sacrifice and spend some time by yourself and um, be, and stay with your grandparents or spend more time with your grandparents? And and I did. And I would stay home on the weekends and watch things like Dancing with the Stars and the Food Network. But I got comfortable being alone. And and I think you feel much more connected to yourself when you're spending time alone for a conscious, healthy reason. And then you do when you're hanging out with the wrong crowd of people you're not aligned with. You feel very lonely. And I'm sure there's plenty of people listening to this who have experienced this throughout their life. And that trajectory of fitness and transformation and personal development is what got me to where I am today. Because once I got out of jail, I kept obviously working out. I lost a bunch of weight and decided I was, you know, like I said, I was going to change my friends, change my nutrition, learn how to cook, read men's health, read men's fitness. I still have like the Arnold encyclopedia bodybuilding and i just got into different things and i learned to channel a lot of that negative stuff into something positive and i decided to to pass the torch that my cellmate had gave me and become a personal trainer and became a trainer back in april of 2011 i mean i got into a point fitness wise where i was happy with the way i looked and i was just i was just ready to help other people use fitness to change their lives so i got a job at a local wellness center and I had to beg for my job, Luke, because I was still a convicted felon. But I literally, like, and again, if people listening to this can just adopt this mentality with anything, it's like this, this whatever it takes mentality, like literally like doing whatever it takes to achieve whatever it is, you might not always win, but you're sure as heck going to be proud of yourself for giving it all you got. And I looked at the hiring manager and I said, I'm a convicted felon. I shared a little bit about my story. And of course they hesitated. And I said, listen, Fitness changed my life. I just you know, gave him my spiel. And then I said, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll pee in a cup every day. I'll do whatever. You, want to you, know, you want my probation um, papers, you want my court papers, whatever. And then after talking to HR and different appoint or different um, interviews, I was given a job. I was given a chance. And I took that as like a new high of helping people because I could relate to these people I was training. Because it, most people, I would say everybody, I would argue, it's not a weight loss thing. It's a happiness thing when they see themselves in the mirror. Like people don't just want to lose weight. They want to be able to look at themselves authentically and be happy with that person they see in the mirror, which is, I mean, why they would want to lose weight is because they feel better about themselves. So I could relate and connect to people that I was training on a deep level because I had been the kid who was ashamed of how I looked like. I was the kid who was depressed. I was the kid who um, you know, felt uncomfortable. I was the kid who just hated myself, which a lot of people, when they come to the gym, they're not happy with the way they look. And you just kind of know when you're in flow, I guess that, you know, I call it now, but back then it was just me just doing me and, and helping other people use fitness. And time flew by. I built a really successful personal training business and um, it came to a point where my probation was up and I, you know, didn't use drugs. I passed all my drug tests, did my community, did my community service, did all my probation stuff. And my probation was complete and it was time for me to write the judge um, a letter for modification of my sentence. And it just so happened I trained a lawyer. We, we crafted up a letter, sent it to him, and he granted me my day in court. And in January of 2014, I stood before him and he took the felony conviction off my record because I completed all the stipulations he gave me. I never realized how much 
you know, one's life can change in a matter of seconds from being, you know, shackled really as a convicted felon and not being able to vote, not being able to leave the country, having to do this, having to do that, not being completely free. And, and it started to get the, the ball rolling that, that I was put on this earth for more than just to train people. And that's when I decided I wanted to start to share my story to help other people. And I wrote my first book from felony to fitness to free to inspire people to make the most of their second chance, turn negative into a positive, and, and also like focus on how far, they, how far they've come, not how far they have to go. Because that's like the hardest thing, I think, for people, especially in recovery. They're like looking at, they're in, sometimes I'm, I mean, I can imagine, again, I didn't get sober in the 12 steps, but people who were in there and they're hearing stories of people who were in recovery for like 40 years, 20 years, they're maybe sober four minutes, four hours. Like, how am I going to get there? But if I can just invite people just to lean in to the fact of how far you've come, you know, the small steps you have made and just focus on that and, and build off of that, you'll get a lot further than if you put your sights solely on like where you're going to be 20 years from now or the person you were 20 um, days ago. Just staying in that present moment and focusing on the positives that you have. Not that everything's going to be positive, but focusing on the positives that you do have in your life will help your mind, help you, like your mindset like operate in a way where you're going to remain more optimistic and more hopeful of where you're going. And then, you know, after my first book, I wrote a couple other books along the way and I've been blessed to share my story on various media outlets and talk to people like you. And, and this is where like the whole notion of the adversity advantage came from was um, I just, I just knew that there's plenty of people that, that go through hard times that make their problems worse. And I did that growing up. I did that completely. But I said, you know, what if I could help people use those dark times to become better? Not that you're going to just take this magical experience that you're going through or this, this experience you're going through and turn it into something magical right away. But what if I could help people use adversity as a muscle and just know that life's going to suck sometimes? It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But it's not that that matters. It's how you adapt to it. It's how you get through it that counts. And so just talking to different people about how they've actually gotten through hard times has been something that's been meaningful to me because I think of adversity as a golf ball size problem. And what happens is the way they respond to it, whether it's excessive drinking or drugs or gambling or spending tons of money, that golf ball becomes a bowling ball. And now they've created more unhealthy habits, unhealthy behaviors as a result of the inability to deal with whatever was placed in front of them in the first place. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really it in a nutshell, dude. You know, it's like, I'm thinking back on, on my relationship with, with drugs and alcohol, and it was, you could minimize it to a tool of just to be able to change your perception of your in this moment experience manually and automatically and for a time reliably yeah right so it's like you get sober however that happens and then what do you have to do to replace that if you want it to last and you want to be fulfilled you do what you just explain which is you come up with organic self-disciplined ways to change your perception of reality right i was i was thinking about um you know, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. John Lawrence, was going to come out here and record a podcast. And he's on his way out here, wasn't feeling that well. I was like, you know what? It's not the right time. I'm going back home. And he's, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I was stoked. I'm like, oh, perfect. That's not what was supposed to happen this weekend. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it wasn't even like, okay, oh, I'm disappointed. This sucks. Now let me like figure out how to change my attitude and my perception. It was just, immediate perception was, you know, I'm sorry that he wasn't feeling well, of course, but it was just like, oh, this is great. Yeah. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Like the same situation happened and that's like a really easy thing. You, you know, take a parking ticket, a divorce or letter from the IRS, whatever, an injury, an illness, a death of a loved one. I mean, of course, that model is scalable and it gets more difficult the more stake you have in said event. But still, it's the same tool. It's the same principle, right? Of that reframing of something. And it's, as you said earlier, it's like, it sounds somewhat vapid or superficial. Like, oh, just think positive. Like, <laughs> yeah. turn that frown upside down. Yeah. And it's corny. But 
actually, it's how life works. And if you're an addict or alcoholic that's actively pursuing that, that's all you're doing is you're just changing your perception of a situation. Like you said, oh, I feel like fat. Girls don't like me. I suck at sports. I had all my issues. My feet were too big. I thought I was dumb, like whatever. I could change that with this facsimile attitude change. Like a it's like a fake way to do that, not an internalized way where you literally shifted your reality based on your perception. You just trick yourself into thinking reality is a little different because you're high on whatever. Well, and I think the thing too is that there's these different muscles that you have to work to be to have to work at in order to be successful in life. And you know, I talked about the adversity muscle, but there's also like the perspective muscle. There's the gratitude muscle. There's the faith muscle. There's the discipline muscle. Like all, I mean, I can go on and on, but these different things that take time to adapt to. And you had the example, you know, a few minutes ago where you were talking about how, oh, this is, just wasn't meant to happen this weekend or whatever. And I think people get caught up again in, in thinking like, why aren't I thinking that way? It takes time, it takes discipline, it takes practice, it takes years. It takes a lot of not thinking that way. And it takes that maybe you have five situations where you do think that way and then you have two that you don't and five that you do. And it's just repetition. It's just discipline. And, and I also think that you know when people are going through adversity, one of the things that I say is, there's like three A's that I like to use. Number one is, is awareness. So meaning like, being aware of what you're feeling, being aware of what you're going through, being aware of what's happening around you, develop awareness. And the second part I think is very important is acceptance, is knowing that this is just part of life. It's part of your life to feel off some days. It's part of life to feel anxious at times. It's part of life to not feel right. It's part of life, right? But I think so many people that get caught up in the shame of it, like, why am I not happy? Or why am I feeling this? Or why am I feeling that? And then they just start to spiral down and spiral down and spiral down. And that bad hour, that bad 30 minutes or that bad three hours or whatever it is turns into a bad three weeks because they're caught up in that shame Uh, cycle. Yeah, you just described my life years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Totally. Right? Yeah. And so once people can gain acceptance and saying, okay, this is happening for me and not to me again, it sounds cliche, but I mean, there's no other way to really think about it during times like that. And then you can start to take the third A, which is action which is like, okay, and that, that doesn't have to be anything like substantial. You don't have to go like run a marathon or anything, but what are some things that are in your toolbox that you know you enjoy doing that you can do to make yourself feel better and are aligned with the person you want to become? Like what are some healthy things? Could be going for a walk, could be meditating, could be calling a friend, could be listening to music. It could be going out and getting a, a healthy meal or what have you. It could be listening to a podcast. It could be watching a funny movie, which is something that I like to do if I'm having a bad day. Like watching something funny is just it's what makes me feel good sometimes. And then that mitigates the adversity because what tends to happen is we have this massive spike of fight or flight when something goes wrong. That's my experience. And then we sometimes will get caught in that fight or flight and we just focus on that. And then when you channel that into something else, a lot of times that fight or flight can flatline a little bit and you feel better for a few reasons, for a few reasons. Number one, because the activity that you did just naturally will make you naturally will make you feel good, whether it's exercising, whether it's watching a movie or going for a walk or meditating, but then you feel better about yourself because you managed a situation that was challenging in a way that was healthy. And I think you, there's a sense of confidence that's built from that. From looking back and being like, wow, like, you know, five months ago, I would have gone and, and drank, or five months ago, I would have snapped on my partner, or five months ago, I would have gone out and spent a bunch of money on stuff I shouldn't be buying. But look where I am now. I chose to take five minutes and practice the pause and write down my thoughts. I took 15 minutes to go take my dog for a walk. I took 30 minutes to go for a drive and listen to a podcast. And then you build off that, that becomes a muscle. And then you start to rewire. Again, I talked about reattaching behavior to emotion. You start to rewire your brain. And then when you get stressed or anxious, the first thing that comes to mind, at least again, this is my experience, isn't to do drugs. It's like, well, where can I get a run in? Who can I call? What kind of podcast can I listen to? What kind of movie can I watch? What kind of, you know, stand-up comedian can I I, uh, watch? And that becomes your new normal. And again, that's what life's all about. When you can create that new normal, 
for yourself the when you're so that when you're going through hard times you're able to challenge it with things that you know um might not feel quote unquote extremely better short term like you're not going to get the same euphoric rush from running that you probably would from snorting a line of coke right i'm sure i don't i mean i don't know what <laughs> depends happens depends how fast you run <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I would say most people probably won't like get that euphoric feeling that people maybe um are used to with if, if they're snorting a lot of coke but what i can guarantee you is this is that after you're done running you'll feel a hell of a lot better than you do after looking back and, and or after you would have snorted that line of coke after that uh, high wears off right oh you, god been, yeah so yeah i mean i think there's a lot the thing lot. i the thing i find interesting about your journey getting to know you a bit today is that you found a model of recovery that is exceedingly rare i know very few people that were legitimate Died in the wool addicts or alcoholics that didn't go through a 12 step program. I mean, it's just, I mean, a lot of people that have had issues with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And ah, it's, I mean, I could probably count them on one hand that I've met in my entire journey that didn't take that route. And um, what I find interesting is that your perspective and the, the chain of events in your experience from meeting the, the Yoda, Brad Pitt. <laughs> ripped yeah you know quasi coach uh guide in in jail uh is that it seems like you got out and you became a seeker of truth and a seeker of fundamental principles by which one can live their life and learn to adhere to and apply and over time those become ingrained in your character and ultimately just become who you are and as a result how you do things right, right. so to me, that's what the 12 steps provide people is a framework of universal truths, spiritual in their nature, which if applied continually over the course of some time, change you and your perspective and your experience of life. But because it's so rare that someone finds another path other than, you know, every once in a while, someone's like becomes an extreme born again Christian or something, yeah. you know, super wild like that happens. Right. And they're just like, poof, they're changed in an enlightenment experience or religious conversion or something of that nature. But yours still to me sounds a little nebulous. You know, it's like, how did you not relapse? Just you got out of jail. We're like, I'm just going to think positive and go to the gym. It's like a lot of people try going to the gym dropping some weight, you know, yeah, thinking positive, reading a couple self-help books, and they end up right back in the bar, right back in the back of a police cruiser. So I, I wonder what what's different about your journey having not gone the 12-step route. And, and more specifically, I think what those other models of recovery do for most people is get some of the falsehoods about who they think they are out of the way and that toxic, erroneous, addictive, negative thinking gets uh, subsided and ultimately you get a bunch of junk out of your way and you form a relationship with the higher power. You find a spiritual way of life through living by those universal truths, right? You, you put these principles in your life and ultimately those lead you to spiritual practices and then to a relationship with some higher power that gives you the fortitude and strength that helps you weather life storms without having to resort to the old coping mechanisms. So in that yeah. long diatribe is the question, how did these practices and truths that you discovered after getting out of jail and getting sober, how did those help you create a spiritual framework for your life or did they? It didn't. It <laughs> I should say this. It did and it didn't. It did in the long run, but initially it didn't. And I guess to go back to your point, one of the things that, that saved me was I was terrified of going back to jail because I just knew that if I went back to pr prison, you know, because I was backing up to five years, that I wouldn't last very long just because I just knew that I just wasn't the guy that would that was meant to survive prison. Like I just wasn't a fighter. You know, I just wasn't me. And so I was terrified. Plus, in a, I guess, a healthy codependent way, I didn't want to let my cellmate down. Like that was part of the motivation. And again, you have to find what drives you. And I've said this before. That was something that drove me. 
was this guy. You don't want to see his ass back in there next weekend. <laughs> hey, sorry, man. Thanks for all your time and effort. I went out and did Oxy. But I was just so, I think, taken back and touched, you know, that this person had come into my life. It's almost like an unexpected angel, if you will, to help me change my life at a time where I had no confidence or ability to do it. And so that was a big part of it. Obviously, the fear of going back to jail. Um, I had a lot of accountability with being on probation too. Like when you're going to the probation officer regularly and having to pee in a cup and report and do all that stuff and go to community service, you're kind of reminded of you know, what's going on, what reality is. And, and, you know, to your point about fitness and what else was there as far as spirituality, because you know, spirituality is a big part of 12 steps. It's a big part of many recovery programs. I muscled my way through it literally like, by working out and, you know, I did change my friends and I, and I think the other thing that, that helped me was because I learned fitness and the importance of focusing on goals. I set goals on other areas of my life. It just happened as a byproduct. And so I started to get involved in different personal development things and go into, to, um, to work to a mentor, a mentorship that, that helped me and, and joined a mastermind group early on when I was in my, was I on my, early twenties, I guess. I forget how old I was. I mean, but early on, I just adopted and, and found, um, success in setting and achieving goals. But there was a point in my life where I hit another, I wouldn't say rock bottom, but there was a point where I was broken and everything really came before me because you have to remember, like people are always asking like, what do you wish you would have had to make you happy back when I was doing drugs? And I can't, fully under I can't fully answer that because from what I know now of what doesn't fulfill me totally is you know back then I was like yeah I just wish I would have had girls or I wish I would have been ripped or I wish I would have just made good money or whatever it was but I've had that and it hasn't brought me 100% happiness it just doesn't and there was a point where I was in the best, shape, some of the best shape of my life. I mean, I was like 5% body fat. I was incredibly ripped at every ab muscle there was. I was making great money as a trainer. Just written my first book. Um, you know, obviously I wasn't using drugs. And, but there was still something inside of me that was missing. I still had resentments about myself. I still was ashamed of who I was. I still had torn relationships with family. Um, there was a lot of guilt. I still was, you know, watching myself just have bad experiences in dating, for instance, and um, self doubt and just my confidence. Like I would look in the mirror and I would still see the fat dog. I had a hard time being like, "This isn't who you are anymore." And I remember I was hanging out with a mentor of mine. He's like, "Dude, you need some, you need some faith in your life." I was like, "What?" I was like, "No way, man." He's like, "Dude, you're you're a good looking dude now. You know, you um, you're successful. You have a good friend group." Um, you've written a book, like, you know, he's going off on all these good things that I had going for me. He's like, but there's just, I think the spirituality part is missing for you. And right around that time, I was training a guy who was a pastor at a non-denominational church. He was, you know, he was very, you know, positive and happy. And he was like, you gotta, you want to come to church with me and we'll go to Chipotle after. I'm like, nope. I was like, I'm going to hell for putting you through this workout. And I never believed in God. Like before, I grew up, um, you know, traditional religion where I knew if you were good, you went to heaven. If you're bad, you went to hell. And so I was on the highway to hell already. I already, you know, checked that box based on my actions growing up. And I also said, if God's about love and he's real, then why did I get picked on? Why this? Why that? Why this? Like asking all these questions that I'm sure other people ask. And there was a time where I was like, again, in the best shape of my life, having these successes. And I was at a retreat and I just broke down. And I could just finally feel this, this void that had been in my life that I had been, I think, using fitness and all these other tools to kind of fill that for a while. It wore off. And I finally decided to, to call my client, who was a pastor, and give like this Christian thing a try. And the, I think the important thing to remember here is it was because I wanted to do it, not because somebody else wanted to do it for me. And so this is kind of, I mean, I, I kind of laugh a little bit at this, but. I called him. I was like, hey, man, I think I'm ready to give my life to Jesus and try this Christian thing. And you would have thought that this guy just won the lottery based on what I just told him. He's like, all right. Like, I went to his office and I just prayed this prayer and I acknowledged that Jesus, Jesus died for my sins and da, 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 da. 
And the same monkey that came off my back when I was doing drugs came off my back that day. I started crying. And I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I don't know how to explain it other than I just started crying. I called my mom when I walked out. And I just, for the first time in my life, I called her and I told her I was sorry for everything I did growing up. And then so over time, I, I acknowledged that Doug didn't get me here. God did. And that I couldn't make up the fact that there was a guy helping me use fitness to change my life in jail. And now I'm helping other people use fitness to change their lives. And I started to realize that I might not have been proud of all the decisions and choices that I made, but because, but God was, because now he's used all of my stuff to help other people. And that became my spiritual journey. And, and it really realized that to help me really realize that things really happen for me and not to me. And I'm not a, you know, check the box, go to church on Sundays type of person. I mean, it's more about a relationship and how I treat other people, but it's given me this sense of purpose and meaning in my life for a lot of the bad stuff that happened that I didn't really fully grasp until that moment. And that's the important thing I think about any, no matter what type of spirituality walk people take, it's kind of like, just got to do what works for you. And if it works great, just keep doing that, but don't be closed off to other forms. I mean, I still like other forms of spirituality. I mean, I still, I mean, I can be friends with anybody. I like to meditate, you know, when I'm good at it or breath work or other things that, you know, people stay in silos about. I mean, it just, you got to do what works for you and just be open to trying new things. Awesome. I knew that was in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, there's no way this fool could have stayed sober without some connection at a certain point. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It was, yeah. I muscled through it for a while, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. there was a time where I had to develop this deep connection with something other than Doug Bobst. Yeah. Well, Doug, you also, I think, you know, it's funny because of course my framework is coming again from the 12 step model, which is yeah. the thing I'm most familiar with. But as you're talking, I'm like, okay, your, your mentor in jail was of service to you, right? Yeah. He loved you unconditionally, right? And then yeah. so many of the experiences that you had when you got out and you started to build a community, right? Yeah. Of like-minded people, support group. You you took yourself out of the former environments, a new yeah. environment completely, like you changed everything. And all of those things, even though your route was different than um, I think the vast majority of people that have been successfully able to remain liberated from that life, uh, the same touch point still ended up coming your way anyway right you know well, you, you hit a certain point at which you went okay there's this spiritual element of my life is missing had kind of a surrender moment there with your buddy at, at, yeah. at the church office and felt something happened right and that was the seed of that relationship there's so many parallels and it just speaks to there not being one right way to do any of this right it's it's almost like we're all doing the same thing right we're 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 exploring our consciousness and our evolution, our growth and a relationship with other people and with some sort of higher power. And we all get the same benefits from it, no matter what route we're taking. It's like all those roads eventually end up in the same place, which is that place of truth and love and, and unity and those things that really make life worth living. Well, I think the one thing too, that's, I know is a big part of the 12 step community that I um, learned early on was accountability. You know, and I had to be accountable to my cellmate when I was in jail. Like I had to be accountable to him. And then when I got out, I was obviously on probation for five years. And then I, my grandparents, when they took me in, they said that I could live there essentially, you know, like rent free. They would, you know, I wouldn't have to pay for groceries. They would, you know, give me, um, they would give me money to, to spend if I wanted to go out with my friends, but I had to, you know, make my bed. I had to take care of my, my room. I had to exercise. I had to have a job and I had to bring them receipts for what I spent money on. So it, it forced me to take accountability. I mean, maybe I didn't have the traditional, obviously sponsor or whatever, if you will, but I still had to have that, that element of responsibility to myself and my actions as I, you know, as I went along the course. And then I think what was different for me was instead of maybe going into 12, to 12 step meetings, I joined, like I said, like I went to a mentorship group fairly early on when I became a trainer. I think it was within a year or two of becoming a trainer. And I joined like a mastermind with like a group, like, like, like a like-minded group of fitness professionals and people that were looking to better themselves and their businesses. So that became like my, my accountability group, if you will, because we were all pushing each other to, to thrive in our businesses, thrive personally, thrive professionally and that sort of thing. So organically, I guess, 
even though my path wasn't as linear as is sometimes the 12 steps, even though they're not can seem because obviously all recovery is like more of a zigzag, if you will. Yeah. I still kind of found my way through all that. Like being of service was a huge um, thing for me. And it's something I've even juggled with now where I'm not training nearly as much as I was when I was a full-time trainer. I'm obviously podcasting more and doing a couple other things where I've had to almost let go of that, where it's been hard because I'm like, wow, I, I go back to jail and this is what saved my life. Not that I'm not exercising because I'm still exor- I'm still working out, but I've had to let go of the fact that you know, right now I'm in a different place than I was when I became a trainer. I've grown a lot. I've met a lot of people. I've built a brand and that sort of thing. So it's been something that's been a struggle of mine is really being okay with um, trusting the process with everything that's going on. Because my level of service, and while the podcast obviously hopefully helps people and there's service to that, most of my service came from passing the torch that my cellmate gave me and helping other people use fitness to change their lives. But essentially, I'm also doing that now where I'm sharing my story and helping to encourage other people that if they, they're struggling to find themselves or explore fitness to just get down and try to do a push up and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I've, I've actually experienced that too, where there was a lack of direct one-on-one service at one point, which had become just such a fulfilling part of my life. And uh, then when I made the move into doing more public and far, far reaching content, I've had to reconcile that lack with the service that I think we do when we create a platform is more diffuse, right? Yeah. It's, you don't get that tangible, like I'm working with this one guy, he's yeah. doing the shit I say <laughs> and it's working and his life is transformed. You know, you get, you get random messages from people on Instagram or your website that are like, yeah. you know, I, I followed X, Y, and Z that you recommended or demonstrated and modeled for me and my life has changed. So it's, it's like a lower touch, a uh, less intimate relationship with those people that you're serving, but ultimately we have to acknowledge that uh, based on the feedback that we get, that this is still service. It's just, you have to acclimate yourself to your, you're kind of casting a wider net, right? You're not, you're not saving the one, not that we're saving anyone, but yeah. contributing to the welfare of, of the one, the one fish that you catch, you're kind of like scooping a bunch up at, at once. And you know, it's a, it's a, a less, a less intimate relationship with the people that you're helping. But I think it's the value of still having your efforts be about contribution and about serving and about, um, you know, alchemizing the things that you've struggled with into solutions for other people that are just now hitting that stage of struggle or those type of challenges. It's, it's a great life, man. It's a rewarding life. It is. And I think the one thing I'll say to that is like, traditionally, while many it's individual, like for individualistic for so many people, traditionally, I think the advice you give to one is very similar to the advice you might give to others, generally speaking. And so like in the one-on-one model, yeah, it's great obviously to have the intimate connection and be able to talk to them on the phone or right now on FaceTime or whatever and have that relationship. But in the podcast space, you know, you could essentially you're either through your own content or when you're interviewing other people, you're getting a lot of the wisdom that you would say to that one person in these episodes and it's being spread to so many more people. Yeah. yeah. And now maybe instead of getting the one or two messages that you would get, like from a couple clients that you would work with, um, you know, per day, you'll get these messages about like, maybe you had a breakthrough with a client one day and they sent you a message like thanking you, you might get 10, 20, 30. And while it can be overwhelming at times, I think it at least gives us a sense of relief that we're on the right path. You know, and in order, and in, in, in both of our lives, we've had to let go of who we were in the prior to become who we were, who we are in the present, who we were, who we want to be in the future. And that's just an important lesson for anybody who's listening to this is that, you know, you got to change yourself before change changes you. You know, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a time in your life where, you know, you've been wanting to make that move or you've been wanting to, whether it's get into recovery, start a podcast, write a book, move, whatever it is, eventually something's going to happen where you're going to be forced to change. And it might be for the good, might be for the bad. And 
but regardless, like you just got to do it and just know that whatever you're doing, there's purpose in that. And would you rather change yourself now where you're kind of more so in control and you're doing it for the right reasons, you're going to be proactive about it, or you're going to be forced to change when something drastic happens in your life. That's, we see that a lot in the health space. Like there, I can't tell you how many people I'm sure they know that they should be like losing that 50 pounds they need to lose, but they wait for the doctor to tell them you just woke up from having a heart attack or whatever it is to change. Like we always wait for things to get super bad in our lives. And I've done this, we've all been there before we actually take that step and say, you know what? Like I need to do something right now. Like, don't wait. Like, I don't care if it's your recovery. I don't care if it's asking that girl out. I don't care if it's a job. Like, life's short. I think the one thing that the pandemic has taught all of us, I don't care what you believe about it, is that life is short. And there's a lot of things in life that we all take for granted. Myself included. I, and I learned all this in jail. I took, I took for granted my health took for granted my emotional health, took for granted my, my uh, spiritual health, my physical health. And it nearly cost me my life. And so I, I invite people listening to this to just take action and, and on yourself, never stop believing in you and, and to, to really focus on how far you've come and not how far you have to go. That's everything in life. I love it, brother. Thank you for coming on the Less Stabless Podcast. Luke, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out today. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fate meant to be. See, last weekend, another interview didn't happen on a Saturday, and yours did. Are you ready to go explore the hill country of Texas with me? Let's go. All right, dude. Thanks right. for coming on. Thanks for having me. Well, if that one didn't leave you inspired, I don't know what will, folks. Thank you so much for joining me on episode 369. I'd like to invite you to come back next week for 370. It's called The Psychology of Stress healing trauma, and turning off triggers with Dr. David Rabin. And we also touch uh, quite a bit on addiction in that episode too. So I guess we're doing kind of a trauma addiction healing series here on the Lifestylist Podcast. And with everything going on in the world, to be honest, I think this has a lot to do with our way up and out of what we're dealing with as a civilization. It's up to each individual to sort out their demons and shadows and triggers and get our shit together individually so that collectively we might stand a chance of pulling through. Uh, and I have no doubt that we will. I think we're in uh, in the midst of a, a great awakening, as scary as it might be. You know, when you're taking a nap sometimes and you get uh, woken up abruptly, you know, your phone goes off or someone slams the door and it's it's a bit jarring. I think we're sort of going through that <laughs> uh, in the collective at the moment. So fear not, we will make it through. And for those of you that want some uh, I guess, off-grid, uncensored content. Uh, remember that you can always join my Telegram channel. I want to warn you, it's um, it's a bit shocking when you get in there, but there are things in there that I just can't say here or elsewhere. You can find that at lukestory.com slash Telegram. And if you want to just uh, stick with the healing light and rainbows and fairies content, which I think is valid. I mean, this episode and next week's episode being... Uh, two in that category, I would say. Then just join my newsletter. I mentioned it in the intro and I'll mention it again. You can find that at lukestory.com slash newsletter. And every Tuesday and sometimes Fridays, I'll send you the new release episodes with links to the complete transcripts, show notes, and links to everything talked about during every episode. So again, that's lukestory.com slash newsletter for uh, current updates promise not to put you in some sort of sales funnel and email you five times a day. I'm very respectful with the newsletter because frankly, I unsubscribe from probably 99% of the emails that I sign up for. So uh, trust me, I know what it's like and I'm very respectful of your inbox and your time. But if you want to hear from me when I put out a new episode, that's an easy way to do it. Uh, very low commitment. And of course it's free. So with that, my friends, thank you so much for your kind time and attention. I trust that these conversations are providing value for you. If you find that to be the case, as always requested, the best way to support the show and my mission here at The Lifestylist is to share these conversations with someone you love, or maybe even someone that you tolerate. In any case, I think the information being presented by our guest 
can be quite transformative and helpful to most people in most times. Thanks, and I'll see you next week with Dr. David Rabin.